Welcome to ETF Market Insights, the ultimate destination for Canadian DIY investors eager for the latest on ETFs and the economy. Join us every week for timely insights and actionable strategies, all brought to you by BMO ETFs and our experienced panelists. Don't forget to subscribe and let's jump right into today's episode. And welcome back to ETF Market Insights. I'm Erin Allen with BMO ETFs. So last week we had some pretty disruptive news in the AI space, and you've probably seen it all over the internet with DeepSeek in China announcing a significant breakthrough on its latest AI model. And it really shocked the market and really companies around the world. Uh, and it's raised a lot of questions. How have they done it so fast for so little? Is it a good thing for AI in general? You know, are the U.S. main competitors overspending and a lot more? Uh, so joining me today to dive into these questions uh, in the world of AI is Frank Downing. He's Director of Research from ARK Invest. And ARK is a global asset manager specializing in thematic investing um, and focusing on disruptive innovation. Uh, BMO has partnered with ARK and we've brought three of their flagship ETFs here to Canada, trading on the TSX in Canadian dollars for Canadian investors. Uh, so we have ARKK, the BMO ARC Innovation ETF, ARKG, the BMO ARC Genomic Revolution ETF, and ARKW, the BMO ARC Next Gen Internet ETF. Thank you so much for joining me, Frank. It's great to have you back on the channel. Yeah, thanks for having me. Happy to be back on. Uh, before we do get started, I just have to give a quick disclaimer and reminder, we're not providing investment advice or recommendations. Today is all about education and information. So Frank, let's dive right in. I'm hoping you can kick it off with a general intro into what's going on with DeepSeek. What was the announcement and what does it mean for the world of AI? Yeah, sure. Um, and it seems like it's been everything. Uh, the only thing the market can talk about uh, since it was announced. But the funny thing is that um, uh, the you know it was a, a couple Mondays ago, by the time this recording goes live, uh, the market really you know reacted over the weekend. Nvidia was down over 15%. There's this you know, new AI lab in China that released this model and, you know, reportedly trained for a fraction of the cost for what we're used to from the uh, US AI labs. I think a, a funny thing is that that model was released, you know, actually a week before that and previewed in November. And they had released the, the model that actually talks about the training costs in December. So over the, the Christmas, New Year's holiday. So it took a while actually for it to build up, even though it feels like this big shock. Um, but to summarize the, the announcement, um, uh, and who it's coming from. DeepSeek is actually a subsidiary of a, a firm founded in 2016 in China called High Flyer. That's a quantitative hedge fund. Uh, and they basically were founded uh, with the mission of using AI to trade the markets better uh, than uh, other quant funds. And as generative AI started to become more mainstream, as they realized they had built up this local AI talent, they created uh, DeepSeek as a subsidiary to focus just on building kind of foundational AI capabilities. And that's where you see this new model, DeepSeek R1, and it's you know built off of a, a third version of a model that's it's generally competitive with uh, what we've seen from US labs like uh, OpenAI and Anthropic, for example. Uh, and the headline that everybody's gravitating towards uh, is from the release in um, the end of December, which is that the model was trained on roughly five to six million dollars worth of gpus that number is an estimate they tell you the number of gpu hours and, and people are applying a two dollars per hour market price for, for gpus that's how you get to this five to six million dollars okay. um and i think that uh, there's a lot of nuance there that's the final training run so once they've done all the r d they've acquired all this data they've tested you know a countless number of approaches they do a final run and that's what they release and that's the only number they released. Mm -hmm. They didn't release the total infrastructure investment that they've spent, which there's different firms doing the research on this. One of them that we think is pretty good is called Semi Analysis. They've estimated they've invested in over a billion dollars of infrastructure and they're using all of that for R&D. Um, and that is kind of the, the truth behind this headline number that seems very small, that totally spooked the market. Um, and and, the and the yeah, yeah, exactly. And then, um, the the R1 model that came out, um, you know, more recently, they didn't release training costs for that at all. So they could have spent, you know, tens of millions. We don't know uh, on how much it costs to train that. Sure, made for a good headline though, didn't it? Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, as a result, we saw a lot of sort of panic selling. You know, Nvidia was crushed. 
how do you see this impacting the larger AI players in the market? What are the implica implications? <laughs> implications. Yeah, uh, <laughs> implications. Yeah. So, so to zoom out for a second, um, yeah. cost declines in AI are not abnormal. They're actually something that you know we look at when we look at technologies. We look for technologies that are exhibiting strong cost declines because that shows that a technology is. Uh, becoming more affordable and ready to be distributed kind of across the world and used in, in, a, in a, think of it as a, a mass uh, market use case. Uh, mm -hmm. And we've seen over the last four years, the cost falling in AI faster than almost any other technology we've ever looked at. So training costs are falling 4x per year, uh, inference costs 10x per year. That's just looking at, you know, the data that's already been out there. So to see a company uh, like DeepSeek emerge with a lower cost model that's the same performance as a model that was released by OpenAI earlier last year is actually in line with trend. It might be slightly faster, uh, but we actually think this is um, uh, in line with general expectations and will increase access to AI over time and increase demand. Uh, and that demand will drive uh, the need for more compute infrastructure to support it. Um, so we don't think there is a structural shift in expectations from, let's say, what the total market for compute will be in 2030, though it may shift, you know, the relative competitive dynamics. Uh, and that's something we can, we can get into with kind of this unique reasoning model approach that OpenAI pioneered and now DeepSeek is open sourcing. Yeah, so it sounds like you're not super uh, surprised that this has happened. Um, do you and you think it's a good development for AI overall, this is a good thing, right? Yes, I think from a geopolitical aspect and the, the competition between US and China heating up, that's definitely a, a, a risk to watch in the long term. I think there'll be policies on both sides to address that. But from mm -hmm. a pure technology uh, perspective, this is definitely a good thing. How does it change the AI investment framework at ARC, if at all? Yeah, I mean, I'll use hardware as an example uh, of how it can shift things. Um, and maybe I'll touch on software too, but on the hardware side, NVIDIA has really been, and this is why you saw their, you know, their stock affected more than anybody else when this kind of news percolated at the top, but uh, they've been in this kind of market leadership position where almost all training and inference workloads. So training, when you're building the model inference, when you're actually, you know, customers are using it, uh, they've been the hardware stack that's powering all of this. Uh, and there's, um, a lot of competition coming for NVIDIA, given how big this market is and how big, you know, ARC thinks it is in our research and uh, the rest of the world at this point. Uh, and, and that competition is coming from people they know from their traditional gaming business, like AMD, for example. It's also coming from their largest customers, uh, all three clouds. Google is the most advanced, Amazon second, followed by Microsoft are building their own in-house chips that they want to serve their own workloads. They want to offer workloads in the cloud uh, and they don't want to be dependent on a single source vendor. And I think DeepSeek at the margin might accelerate that uh, shift, uh, particularly because it means uh, there's a more diverse number of customers that are looking for compute. Uh, so rather than, let's say, if AI only existed in, in the US and was only being developed by four firms, like the, the leading AI labs, uh, that's a pretty narrow set that NVIDIA can sell into. But now you have this kind of much longer tail uh, and you can have newer chip companies. The startup space is really hot right now with uh, chips that are coming and specifically focused on inference. Uh, two companies, Cerebris and Grok, are, are particularly positioned there um, and, and looking to offer better performance at a lower price uh, is the short of it. Um, and the, the deep seek model um, reasoning is what they call it, but it's basically the model's ability to stop and think before it answers. Okay. which results in better quality answers, which kind of sounds intuitive when I say that, but it's a new advance and that requires a lot more inference. So the companies that are competing on this inference front may accelerate kind of these share shifts that we think will take place over the next five or six years. Okay, so much opportunity. Now, we have Trump in office now, and I think it was on his first day, he signed an executive order for a $500 billion AI infrastructure investment. Walk us through how you see this impacting the space. Yeah, and it seems like that would be totally at odds with the um, with the the narrative of deep sleep mm -hmm. lowering the needs of compute. Um, and I think at the end of the day, we're like, we look at this as the opportunity to dramatically increase the productivity of knowledge work. Where there's over a billion people every day that spend their day doing knowledge work tasks, working on a computer, uh, getting things done. You now have this ability for um, software to augment or in some cases replace what 
uh, humans were doing. And I think what that's going to result is that, you know, time is going to shift with what humans are spending and we're going to spend a lot more on software. Uh, and so we think the opportunity is opening up dramatically as we're kind of digitizing the thinking process and the reasoning model is a good example of that. Uh, and in doing that, we're going to create this tremendous demand for compute that we don't have right now because all compute is, is in a way tethered to uh, you sitting at your laptop, maybe accessing a cloud service. It's, it's tethered to the human element. You can only do so many tasks or trigger so much compute to happen. But when you have an AI agent that's going and acting autonomously and you can just delegate at work and say, go work for 30 minutes on this problem. And then you realize that you have 10 problems to solve. And instead of doing that sequentially, you can do it in parallel and say, why would I solve this problem after the last one? I'm going to do all 10 at the same time. That's mm -hmm. this kind of like scalability of, of, of human knowledge work that can happen when you add compute to accelerate it. Uh, and I think these, you know, 100 billion CapEx plans from hyperscalers, the 500 billion Stargate project um, are all expecting that future to play out, that we're going to need compute to power uh, this kind of acceleration of, of human intelligence. Fantastic. Very exciting. And this week, um, well, we, it hasn't dropped yet when we're recording this, but this week you are dropping your big ideas report. So everybody can get a copy of that from, from your website, but I'm hoping you can give me a sneak peek into some of the themes that, uh, are impacting AI this year. Sure. I mean, that this is uh, always a fun time of year getting to share our, our big ideas report and, and the center of the story is always, uh, the innovation platforms that we base our research on, uh, the five innovation platforms, artificial intelligence being front and center, of course, multiomic sequencing, uh, robotics, energy storage, and blockchain technology, and how these uh, innovation platforms really converging to creating to create exciting opportunities. And autonomous driving is one of those. We heard on Tesla's earnings call last week, their plans to launch ride hail services this year. Uh, Waymo's already been doing it for several years. So this is something that you know, five years ago, people called us crazy for thinking what happened. And now there's two companies that are uh, uh, doing it, uh, going to be doing it in the US, which is really exciting. So we dive into uh, everything that means from the autonomous side. We dive into something that's happening faster than we thought, which is the application of AI and robots together to create humanoid robots, which kind of accelerate, just talking a lot about knowledge work, but accelerate manual labor uh, as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And then on, on AI as a kind of a foundational platform, I mean, those cost declines are a consistent narrative that we've seen, the need for more compute, and what is that compute powering these kind of autonomous AI agents that we think are going to transform uh, both the way consumers live their lives, how they make purchases, and how work gets done uh, in a business setting. So there's uh, almost more than ever to be excited about. And we think, I mean, the net short of it is companies that are pursuing these innovative technologies are going to see outsized returns uh, through 2030. Okay. And were there any emerging technologies that you guys talked about, maybe that you didn't have in last year's report uh, that are going to have a big impact on global markets in the next three to five years? Yeah, I previewed one, which we did have a slide on, but I think humanoid robots uh, yeah. were, were going deeper in our research and is becoming something that we think is going to be sooner rather than later. Uh, and then also, given the dynamic of um, the, the compute infrastructure that we need, there's a strong energy demand to power that or energy requirement. And so we have a section on nuclear uh, energy this year as well. Um, so I think that will all be good deep dives expanding what we've uh, kind of previewed in the past. Awesome. Well, everybody should check it out and go download a copy. Uh, I can't wait to get mine and read more about it. Um, thank you so much for joining me, Frank, and, and breaking that all down for us today. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me, Aaron. All right, that's all for today. We will see you next week. Bye for now. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of ETF Market Insights. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and sign up for alerts so you never miss our latest content. For more insights and to keep the conversation going, visit us at etfmarketinsights.com. Join our mailing list and explore a wealth of resources and tools designed just for ETF investors. Until next time, stay informed and empowered in your investing journey. This session is for informational purposes only. Any reference to a particular company or product is for illustrative purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice or a recommendation to buy or sell. Particular investment and or trading strategies should be evaluated relative to the individual's investment objectives and professional advice should be obtained with respect to your unique circumstances.